In a world that's both more connected and more isolated than ever before, we're often tempted to do life alone, either because we're so busy or because relationships feel risky and hard. But science confirms what faith communities have always known, that consistent, meaningful connection with others has a powerful impact on our well-being. We are meant to live known and loved, but so many are hiding behind emotional walls that we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. Join us in this four-week series to help you find your people. One of the things that I've learned through working with a church growth coach is the difference between being recognized and being known. My goal in Potterville is that I'd go beyond people just recognizing me to knowing me. It's the same goal I have for our church, that we'd move from people just recognizing who we are as a church to knowing who we are. And what I found is that being known is difficult. You can just show up and you can be recognized by people, but to be known requires some extra effort. It requires reaching out to other people. It requires opening up and talking about myself. And all that effort, it also has to happen consistently over time in order to move from recognized to known. Now, one of the ways I've been working to become known in the Potterville community is through my involvement with the Potterville Chamber of Business. I started on the chamber when I first came to Potterville and for the past several years, I was an officer of the chamber. I served as the vice president. I served as the secretary. Now, my involvement with the chamber eventually led to my involvement with the Gizzard Fest committee. And I've been involved in planning and executing the Gizzard Fest the past several years in Potterville. Now, those monthly chamber meetings and the regular Gizzard Fest committee meetings, they don't help me to know or be known by everyone in Potterville. But I have gotten to know and be known by the people who are part of the chamber and the people who are part of the Gizzard Fest committee. I know Luann, our local librarian, and she knows me. I know Aaron Sheridan, our Potterville city manager, and he knows me. I know Chris Draves, the owner of our Potterville McDonald's, and he knows me. And I could go on and on. I'm working toward moving from being recognized to known. Now, hundreds of years ago, the tasks of daily life were lived out in community. The people around you, including your family, would work together, would eat meals together, rest and recreate together. But that's changed over the years and it changed rapidly with the Industrial Revolution. We started to choose better jobs over the communities or the people that we loved. We saw the rise of factories and reduced time with family and with friends. Our workday became scheduled around a clock, not by the setting or the rising of the sun. And we saw the rise of commuting where we travel more and more to and from work. We now spend more and more time working and less time at home and in our neighborhoods. And most of us experience a big disconnect between our daily life and our community, the, the people around us. We're recognized by many, but we're known by few. And it's no wonder so many of us are lonely. We're lonely even when we're around other people. We're recognized, but we're not known. And that's a big problem. We've centered our current series, Find Your People, on a key scripture. We're using Pastor Tom's translation of this verse from Genesis to remind us that it is not good for the human to be alone. It's not good for me or, or for you or for anyone to be alone. We were made for belonging and for relationships. So this week we are continuing our series called Find Your People. It's based on a book of that same name by Jenny Allen and well, I found what Jenny Allen says about friendship to be really helpful. And I'll also admit, I don't always agree with Jenny Allen. So throughout this series, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the good stuff from this book to help us find our people. We're keeping the best and leaving the rest, just like it says on the billboard for the new Eastwood campus. Now today we're going to cover the final two practices that Jenny Allen proposes as tools to help us connect in deeper ways. We're moving from being recognized to being known. So here's the path to connection that we first introduced last week. So the path starts with proximity, and then there's transparency, and then accountability, 
and then purpose, and then consistency. Now last week we talked about proximity and transparency and accountability. Today we're gonna to talk about these next two things, purpose and consistency, and how they can help move us toward finding our people, toward finding the community that God wants for us. And what this is gonna lead us to is depth and commitment, through depth and commitment. Well, let's start with depth. We get to depth through shared purpose. And again, that's, that's the path to connection. As I mentioned earlier, it's possible to go through life interacting with lots of different people and yet to still feel like we are isolated and alone. And this happens when we go to work or to school or to activities or to run errands and we don't have any closeness with the people who are part of those settings. But the reality is that there are people all around us who we can share purpose with if only we'd move beyond being recognized to being known. Now I want to be clear that today I'm not telling you that you have to go out and meet a whole bunch of new people. Although, maybe that's a step that some of you do need to take. Instead, what I'd like us to do is to recognize who's already in our lives right now. Who are our neighbors? Who do you regularly interact with? This is not about getting to know more people. It's about getting to know the people we already know better. It's moving from recognized to known. Think about what you're doing right now in this season of your life. The two of the things that I'm involved in this fall are going to my daughter Kate's swim meets and my son Drew's marching band performances. Both of those things are pretty regular. And between those two activities, there's just about something every week that I'm attending. Now, think about that. And then next, contemplate who are you doing those things with? So I often attend these events with my wife, Jana, and I'm surrounded by other parents and grandparents and guardians of the other participants in swim or band. Every week there are dozens of people around me that I could get to know better. Now, I don't have to get to know all of them and I won't, but <laughs> I do think that I can get to know someone, at least one person a little bit better. Now the examples of the swim meet or the marching band performance bring up an important point about what brings people together. People unite around shared purpose. Those activities, those things that we have together, when we unite around a purpose, we might have different gifts and talents and abilities and roles, but each of us play a part in accomplishing something. When we function together at our best as human beings, no one role is more important than another. They're all a part of us accomplishing something. Now that brings us to our first question for discussion. We're going to pause a moment here to think about this question for, for discussion. But what settings are you currently in where there are people that you could get to know better? Let's take a moment and talk about that. So we've already talked about how in the beginning, God made us, God made humans to be in community. It's not good for the human being to be alone. From the beginning, God also made humans for purpose. Genesis, the book of the Bible about beginnings, also tells us that God blessed them, that is humans, and said to them, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and master it. It's a reminder that we are made to care for our earth and to cultivate it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. As humans, we are partners with God working toward the flourishing of our earth. It's embedded in us to be filled with purpose. And if we follow Jesus, well, our lives take on added purpose and meaning. To his first disciples, Jesus said, go, go and make more disciples. So as we grow in our love of God and of those around us, we also share that love with others. It's our purpose. To the local church, the group of people that follow Jesus, we live out this purpose and meaning together to go and make more disciples. God gives us a shared purpose along with the gifts that allow us to depend on each other to accomplish that purpose. We were made for connection through a shared purpose. Purpose. And the thing about friendship that we often miss is that it's not all about us. The most satisfying relationships that we'll have are centered on something bigger 
than the relationship itself. Purpose and mission go hand in hand. And if, if you are a follower of Jesus, well, you have a built-in purpose or mission that's bigger than your school or your job or your neighborhood or your family. You have a purpose to share the love of God. And the cool thing is that you have a team of people available to pursue this purpose with you. Sycamore Creek Church. Our mission, our purpose is to ignite authentic life in Christ and fan it into an all-consuming flame. And we want to do that together with you. Now, as we pursue our mission, it brings us together with a shared purpose. That pursuit of our mission, well, it's really led by our pastors. I expect that I've given more than most of you to the mission of Sycamore Creek Church. I'm all in on our church and our mission. I give my time, a lot of it. I give my thoughts, a lot of them. I give my effort, I give my money. I, I bring my family into our mission. And I've given up other things that I could be doing. The largest being a breast cancer research career that I left to become a pastor. And in the midst of pursuing the mission of Sycamore Creek, I'm super grateful that we're a multi-site church where I lurk, work alongside other pastors, Mikkel and Tom. They're right there with me in their commitment to our church and to our mission. I pastor with Tom and Mikkel on our shared purpose as pastors of Sycamore Creek Church but it also gives us the opportunity for deep friendship through that shared purpose. Now, Mikkel and Tom and I, we do have that shared purpose, but, but friendship still requires that we go deeper than shallow talk with each other. So each month, the three of us schedule a no work talk evening gathering that we call Clergy Night Out. In June, we went to see Jesus Christ Superstar together at the Wharton, and we spent time together before and after that show just hanging out. Our work is improved through friendship and through the intersection of relationship and purpose. Now returning again to this idea of work, our work is really important. And many of us have lost sight of that. Your work, whatever it is, it's important. You contribute to our society's functioning. At its best, work is meant to bring fulfillment and to promote thriving for the people that we love and know. And it's important to be compensated for that contributing to our society, but Work is less about just earning a paycheck, and it's more about in some way contributing to human thriving. Now, there are so many ways that human thriving can be accomplished, and your work in that thriving matters. Now, for many of us to think this way, that's a perspective shift. And here's the shift. What if whatever you are involved in becomes a mission field, and the people in those places become your teammates? Whatever you are involved in, it, it could be school, it can be work, it can be neighborhoods, it can be doctor visits, and it can be going out to eat, it can be buying groceries. It, and again, if, if whatever you are involved in, well, thinking this way, this has the potential to transform whole areas of our lives, uh, to give them added meaning and purpose and connection. And again, here's this perspective shift com summarized. Anywhere can become a place to carry out our mission, and anyone can become our teammates. So what are you currently doing? Who in those spaces or places can you cultivate relationships with? Who can you invite into what you're currently doing? Anywhere can become a place to carry out your mission and anyone can become your teammates. And if you're not doing anything right now, and, and this isn't for all of you, if you're not doing anything right now, I wanna challenge you. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Here's the summary of what Paul is saying. Do something, do something. We were made for purpose and connectedness through that purpose. Live your life on a mission to share God's love. And that's not, just, that's not just a Sunday morning worship thing. This is an every day of the week thing. This is an every moment of our lives thing. But when we live our lives with purpose with other people, we cut through the recognition and we move towards something deeper, being known. Find your people through the depth of shared purpose. Now, Sycamore Creek is a great place to find that shared purpose and a great way to find people 
is in small groups. I wanna encourage you to get connected with a group or an event and use those opportunities to move beyond shallow small talk to something deeper through shared purpose. Now, as you get to know people more deeply, another huge barrier is gonna come, come up, conflict. Our goal is the consistency that comes from commitment, but the barrier to commitment and consistency is conflict. If you are in just about any relationship, there will come a time when you are faced with a decision of whether to continue in the relationship or bail out of it. I'm done. And this isn't a decision you just make once and then you're committed forever to each other. It's a decision that we face every time we have conflict in a relationship. Conflict can keep us from finding our people. Now, there are lots of ways that we can respond to conflict. We can, we can self-protect in conflict. We can be very adaptive. We can blame the other person for the conflict. We can pull back. We can walk away. We can ignore the conflict. Or we can do the difficult work of loving each other through conflict. This is such difficult work. It, it's challenging to love someone through seeking understanding. And it's possible. It's possible to love through staying and working through hurts and through forgiveness and through repentance and through repair. Conflict gives us an incredible opportunity to deepen our relationships if we don't run. Because in conflict, we have the opportunity to grow. As Jenny Allen writes, conflict isn't the enemy to our friendships. Conflict is fodder to make them grow. Now, as we switch gears here and get into conflict, let's pause to reflect on conflict a bit. Think about your relationships and how you approach conflict. And then turn to someone around you and put it in the chat. Answer this question. What are your thoughts on conflict? Can it be a good thing? Let's discuss that. We said this before at Sycamore Creek Church, and I'll say it again. Conflict is inevitable in community. It's gonna happen, even here in our church, even in your home, even with your family. And when handled biblically, according to God's wisdom, what can strengthen and deepen our relationships. Relational health is not the absence of conflict, it's working through conflict together. God wants a close, personal relationship with each of us. And, and God wants us to have close personal relationships, maybe not with everyone, but for sure with someone. It's not good for the human to be alone. Now, close relationships involve letting people into our daily lives, letting them into our deepest struggles, into those areas where we have missed the mark, into our routines, into our work, into our dreams. And when we do that, we begin to live out some familiar biblical phrases encourage one another and build each other up, bear one another's burdens, comfort each other, confess your sins to one another, forgive one another. How are you doing with those instructions from the Bible for following Jesus? Are those verses that you're actually living out or do you just read them as good advice but don't actually follow them? In order to live out those instructions, we have to be close to someone. We, we have to choose to engage the people around us. And you can't do this with everyone, and I'm not saying that you should, but we all need someone. And in order to make a close relationship work, we're gonna be faced with the choice to stay when there is conflict. That's commitment. Now, when we're close to people, we're gonna get hurt. And we're going to hurt others. Not that long ago, I was in a church vision team meeting that involved a misunderstanding and a disagreement between me and Tom and Mikkel. And at the end of our meeting, and we often do this at Sycamore Creek, we do a checkout. And the checkout for that meeting was to work through the disagreement and misunderstanding together. We reflected together and we worked through things together. And it was work, work that we do because we're committed to each other on our vision team. Now, here's the tough truth. Hurt is part of health. When we're close to people, there will be pain in that closeness. And the more you open yourself up to love, the more you open yourself up to hurt. And it's worth it. But can I clarify something here? 
This has nothing to do with abuse. The hurt of abuse is not, it's not part of health. And what I'm talking about here are everyday hurts that we experience because we're flawed human beings who don't perfectly communicate with each other, who don't perfectly act, who are inherently selfish. And if you're in an abusive situation, get to a safe place and know that despite the hurt of abuse, there are relationships that involve hurt that's not abuse. And those relationships are worth it. But no relationship is going to be totally hurt free. And knowing it's worth it, well, it doesn't take away the pain. Many of us have suffered in the past when we've opened ourselves up and, well, that pain, that can be raw and real and deep. And so we're reluctant to try again. And I get that pain. So much of being a pastor is about relationships. And it hurts when I open myself up to someone and they disappear. Or they tell me what they don't like about our church and then they disappear. I'm a human being. I, I like to be liked and the pain of rejection is hard. Which takes us back to sharing relationships where God is at the center and where we're united in a shared mission. If we look to the relationships around us to heal us and fulfill us, it doesn't work. People pleasing, pride, and personal happiness creeps in without centering our lives on God. It's only when our lives are centered on God that we can be free enough, loving enough, and humble enough to healthfully navigate our relationships. So again, what we're talking about here is conflict, not abuse. And the truth is that healthy relationships have healthy conflict. That gives us a posture of humility regarding conflict. We don't have to run from it and we can healthfully navigate it together. So let's go over a couple quick tips for having healthy conflict that helps us to live out consistency on our path to connection. Healthy conflict involves assuming the best in those close to us. Don't jump immediately to worst case scenarios with those with whom you are closest, but instead take the time to understand. Healthy conflict also involves keeping short accounts. Don't let bitterness or anger fester in your relationships. Don't hang on to hurts. Don't keep a running tab of the people you love false. Healthy conflict also involves being quick to apologize. I have a tendency to get defensive when someone says I've caused them pain or harm. And if someone is hurt, our best response is to apologize and to do the work together to make it right. Healthy conflict also involves aiming to be a peacemaker. Don't just wait for conflict to come to you. Active peacemakers reach out in their relationships to seek resolution to conflict. Be the person who makes the first move to resolve conflict. As Paul said, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So the challenge before us when it comes to depth and to commitment is to prioritize our relationships over and over. We will miscommunicate. We will get hurt. We will hurt someone else. We will inconvenience each other. And there's a temptation in the midst of the messiness of relationships to quit. There's a temptation to settle for being recognized. And so in the midst of this challenge, we get to choose. We can choose whether or not to be inconvenienced for the sake of each other. Inconvenience. Now, other people, let's, let's be honest, other people are really an inconvenience if you stop and think about it. All relationships are a giant inconvenience. And through relationships, there's also laughter and love and hopes and dreams and fun and meaning and purpose. And we need those things. Jenny Allen writes, to leave behind our loneliness and enjoy the reward of community, we have to keep showing up. We have to keep being vulnerable, keep coming to the table, be together, work together, and share life together over and over again. And then one day we look up and realize our friendships have grown deep over and over again. That's the last thought I have for us today. Close relationships take time. We'll not have the friendships that we long for, the ones that have depth and commitment without a significant amount of time spent together. It takes time to feel connected and to feel known. It takes time to work through conflict. 
And if today you aren't feeling close to someone and you want to be closer to them, spend more time together. Faithfully put in the time together to develop a deeper relationship. Put in the effort to go beyond small talk. Pursue shared purpose with others. Now, some of the times I've felt closest to the people on the Gizzard Fest committee is when we've been working through conflict together. And the people on the Gizzard Fest committee, we don't always agree with each other. And we work through those disagreements together. And when planning a large gathering, a festival, we know that there will be criticism from the community. And we listen to and we respond to that criticism together. It's a powerful thing to keep showing up for each other, even when it's hard. And we keep showing up for each other in our shared purpose of bringing our community together through Gizzard Fest. I want to encourage you today to find your people, to find them through showing up again and again for each other. A huge reason many of us are lonely is because we've given up on people. Real, authentic relationships, deep relationships take time to grow and develop. A lot of time. It's a lot of showing up. It's a lot of challenges. It's a lot of laughter. It's a lot of shared coffee and food. It's a lot of inconvenience. And it's worth it. I want to encourage you, sign up for a small group this week. Reach out to someone at your workplace. Get out of your house and knock on your neighbor's door. Strike up a conversation with the person who is sitting next to you. Go beyond recognition to being known. Go forth and find your people. 